the Tuesday, October 29th, 2024, special meeting of the Everett Public Schools Board of Directors is hereby called to order. <laughs> Will the secretary please call the roll? President Mitchell. Present. Vice President Herman. Present. Director Mason. Present. Director Atkins. Present. Director Evelinsky. Present. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Saltzman, uh, have there been any changes to the agenda since it was called? Yes, Madam Chair, there's one change to the agenda. The presentation was at. Thank you so much. Um, and I think Director, or Dr. Bowden. Yes, thank you. Good evening, uh, President Mitchell, Board of Directors, Dr. Salzman. Um, we want to appreciate and thank you for this opportunity for this board, board work study session so that we can share with you some uh, updates regarding our highly capable programming. In the next hour or so, we're excited to share about the growth that we're experiencing in our highly capable programs, as well as a proposal for how we plan to manage the growth to support student learning. Um, to set the stage, we want to be able to first share a little bit about our program background. Um, we think it's really important for us to make sure that we have a very clear understanding about what is highly capable, who are the students that are in HC, um, how do we identify those students, and what programs and services do we offer? Uh, then we want to outline the growth of the highly capable program so that you as the board have a good understanding about where we're growing um, and the short term and potential long term impacts of program growth. Um, and then we'd like to share a proposed program, uh, a proposed plan for the growth. We will also share this plan to manage the impacts of growth within our system, addressing needs of a growing program that mitigates overcrowding improves access by bringing students closer to their neighborhood schools and ensures smaller class sizes to support personalized learning. We'll also share our plan to communicate this, our, these proposed changes. We want to communicate the plan to make sure that the program has some transparency um, and really make sure that uh, our constituents are aware of what the changes might be and we want to share that with all of our stakeholders. So that plan for rolling out the, the changes, as well as how we're going to be seeking input from our families on concerns or questions they might have about the process, so that they're very clear about what those changes are and how they may impact their family. And we'll also be looking to share some opportunities. There are always opportunities in our system to get better and smarter about what we're doing, and also kind of our next steps as we're moving forward through this process. While we're experiencing growth in our highly capable program, and that's really exciting, we want to make sure that we're exploring opportunities for future growth and seeking out ways to grow the program in a more inclusive way, um, evaluating opportunities to provide services to more diverse student populations in locations that are within the proximity of neighborhood schools and their communities. So finally, we'll come to a place in our presentation this afternoon where we're going to ask for some considerations and input from the board. We're really hoping that the directors will provide us with your considerations and input as we prepare for some of these changes to support our growing programs in the needs for 2025 and beyond. So here to provide some program background is P5 director Ann Arnold. She oversees um, P5 instruction as well as early learning, but part of that process is elementary highly capable programming. So, Ian? Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you about our exciting, highly capable program and the opportunities we have for um, growth and expansion as we move <laughs> forward. To begin, I'd like to share some just definitions about, about highly capable students and gifted students. I'm going to hide that. Um, often these two terms are used synonymously. I'm sure you've heard them both ways. Highly capable students, however, are defined as those who perform or show potential to perform at a significantly higher academic level than their peers. Exceptional abilities include intellectual aptitude, academic skills, creativity, capacity to learn with deep understanding, retain what they learn, and transfer the learning to new situations. About 5 to 10 percent of our student population, or the population in general, could fall into the category of highly capable. On the other side of our slide, we have the gifted student definition, which is actually um, defined as students or people who have a brain-based difference in how they learn and process information. You'll see many of the similar um, exceptional abilities, intellectual aptitude, creativity, intensity, intuitiveness, heightened self-awareness, enthusiasm, 
elevated sense of justice, and there are many other characteristics that are included in this group. But gifted students or gifted individuals constitute only one to two percent of the population. It's, there's quite a difference, and it's important that we note that, that the program that OSPI supports and funds and the program that we offer in Everett Public Schools is defined as a highly capable program. We hope in that process to um, also we hope in that process to identify and those students who are also uh, highly capable and gifted. So it's not that we're excluding anyone, it's just that we have a definition that's a little bit broader and more inclusive of more students when we and get into that. Kind of the, the, the state, I think they've always said gifted. No, they say highly capable, they say actually. They highly capable, not OSPI, but their RCWs are waxed. Do you say highly capable? Yes. Okay, thank yes. you, thank you. Very, very clearly, in fact, and, and they um, continually seek to expand the identification process and be able to um, uh, be more inclusive of more students with that definition. So I'm just going to go through our process in Everett and the way we work, move forward with this program. So how do we identify highly capable students in Everett? And again, we're hoping to also include gifted students, and that's why we have such a comprehensive identification program. So again, OSPI provides highly a highly capable grant to support the identification and placement of students. The board annually approves that, um, the plan we have and the acceptance of that grant. And again, it, it, the process seeks to identify both highly capable and gifted students. So the way we um, process this information is that in kindergarten, uh, parents, guardians, community members, and teachers can refer any student for testing in the highly, for the highly capable program. This is a modified testing process. It's not the whole all-day testing procedure. We use a screener, COGAT screener, which stands for the Cognitive Abilities Test, and it's about an hour process. So we have sent out proctors, we screen those students, and then we have a committee that reviews those scores along with their walk hit scores, and we make recommendations for identification and placement into the program. In first grade, we do universal screening with the COGAT screener for, for first and fifth grade students. Um, and that's, the fifth grade part is new last year. So we have in Everett um, actually screened first grade students for a very long time universally, which is a, a really great thing because that's where we miss, that's where we find the students that we might miss if we were only looking for a referral. Yes. Can we ask questions since it's a work session? Sure. Um, so highly capable in our, we start in the second grade. The self-contained classroom start in the second grade. We have so a, the kindergarten screen is just for teacher identification. And then we have a program called LEAP, which I'm just going to tell you about in a minute, okay. which is in the general ed classroom taught by the teacher. Okay, thank so you. So it's, it's an identification thing. It's not a placement thing. So um, universal screening for first and fifth grade, and then the full highly capable testing, which is what you were just asking about. Um, it includes the complete COGAT and the IO assessments. That is, happens by referral in first, second, third, and fourth grade. It's happening right now. And uh, that testing goes through the month of January. And that's for placement in the self-contained classrooms. And did we change that first through fourth, or like second, third, fourth a few years ago? Have we always had first through fourth got screened? Got screened? They get they, we've had that for a long time because our program is for second to fifth grade. Okay. So they get screened the year before for placement in the following year. Okay, so the universal happens to all first and fifth, and then for that full screening, is that referral based? Yes, and it can be referral by a parent, a guardian, a teacher, a community member. Anyone can refer a child, a, a student can refer okay. themselves. Okay, but the universal only happens the two. Right, okay. at those two grades. And those grades were chosen because first grade, obviously, and we put students into the self-contained classrooms if, if they agree to that placement in second grade. In fifth grade, that we were required to do two grades across the elementary years. And um, we made the decision around fifth grade because although we don't have a program to put them in in sixth grade, um, students in middle school have opportunities to choose advanced placement and accelerated tracks. And if the student is fairly new to the system, has come in after the first grade screening and never had a referral, we would have missed them, and we want to be sure we don't do that, so they know they have that opportunity. Yeah, because, they, because there is advancement. <laughs> right, and that keeps going all the way through yeah. high school. Right, exactly. Okay, so how do we serve highly capable students once they've been identified? So we have the two programs, and this is what you were asking about. 
Um, the program that would serve kindergartners in the second half of the year, first graders before they become eligible for highly capable, and fifth graders if they haven't been identified before, is called LEAP. It's Learning Enrichment Achievement Program. And it's defined as differentiated and rich learning experiences in math and or ELA, reading and writing, provided in the general education classrooms by the general education teacher. So once we have students who have been identified for this program, their names are sent out to their teachers once their parents sign a consent form. They are, um, they are, we give teachers guidance around areas of the curriculum where they have opportunities to accelerate and extend and deepen uh, the learning experience uh, in, in the classroom. So there's no movement that happens there. When those letters go out, we just are sending out the first grade letters right now. We also recommend that parents consider having their student go through the full highly capable testing. We want them to know that your student was identified for LEAP, but there's a, another opportunity in the self-contained classroom program. So that happens, and that's right here. Self-contained, highly capable classroom. This is accelerated instruction in all content areas. ELA and math accelerate by one whole grade level. And then it's offered in grades two through five at currently seven highly capable centers or elementary schools. Students who aren't at that school are provided bus transportation to participate in that school. Often siblings um, will get into the school through a variance if there's room that opens up a lot of our space issues around for facilities, but that's how it's usually managed. So where do we serve highly capable students? I just referenced the seven centers. They're listed here, Cedarwood, Forest View, Mill Creek, Penny Creek, Tambar Creek, U Ridge and Whittier. They're all across our district and they serve students in all the different parts of the district. The interesting thing that we want to share tonight and talk about is the growth that we've experienced because it's been significant. I think partly because of the universal screening that's given us opportunities to identify more students, but it's also related to just the growth and enrollment in our district, particularly in certain parts of the district where we have um, schools that are really, really at capacity. So in 2019, prior to the pandemic, we served 630 students in highly capable classrooms. These are the self-contained classrooms. And this year, we are serving 857 students in highly capable classrooms. So you can see we've had really significant growth in this program and uh, significant demand for space. And Shelly's going to talk to you now about those considerations. So we'd like to walk you a little bit through the process when we think about this program growth and some space considerations. Um, and program growth is actually a really exciting thing. But anytime that we have programs that are growing and we're meeting the needs of students, it's really, it's great for us to be able to continue to meet them, um, ideally as close to their neighborhood schools, if not in their neighborhood schools, as possible. Um, however, uh, this Venn diagram shows a little bit about some factors that we take into consideration when we experience things like growth so that we can ensure that we have a really thoughtful process that's going to meet the needs of our constituents. Um, so you'll see uh, location, program, and facility in there and how they interact. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that for our programs, we're talking about all sorts of different kinds of programs. So sometimes we have programs that are not able to be offered at all district locations um, and need to be placed in certain schools just to meet needs. Uh, there are some like instructional programs that are offered at every school. So for example, um, music or PE at an elementary school, we offer that at all 18 of our elementary schools for students to have access to that so that we can meet their needs. And that is actually um, an opportunity to serve in every school because those staffing pieces are built into our resource allocations because we utilize those teachers, um, those specialists as we kind of call them, as planning time in those schools. So those are kind of offered at all schools. But there are some specialized programs where we're still required to serve students, but it might be a select number of students, a smaller population, uh, rather than a very large population across the building. And those aren't necessarily always part of a standard allocation or can be done as a specialist would do. And those are things like special services programs. So when we have uh, like an ACHIEVE program for students with IEPs specifically in behaviors, or if we have um, extended resource room, there are, that's a smaller population across our district, and it's not fiscally responsible to have a program like that, a self-contained program like that, housed in every single elementary school. So we try our best to centralize those locations so that we can provide students the opportunity to access those programs 
um, and still be close to their community and their neighborhood schools. It doesn't make sense to say, we're gonna have all of these specialized programs housed in the north end of the district because that creates a barrier for our families in the south and vice versa. So we do a lot of that centralization when we have programs that exist that serve smaller numbers of students. But location is a really important factor and that is so that we can provide um, access to those families. And so special education programs, like I said, can't be located just at one end of the district. Um, it would present not only a hardship to parents who are trying to access the school and are part of that school community, but it also can mean very, very long bus rides for children, and that's not in students' best interest. So when we think about those location, we're always trying to keep our eyes focused on how do we provide services to those students through our programs as close to home as possible, if not in their neighborhood school, then as close to their neighborhood school as we can. And then finally, that third factor that we're looking at is facilities. And facilities is not just about space capacity, um, but it's also about functionality and access. So we know that as enrollment grows, technically speaking, a lot of our space capacity, our building total capacity doesn't always grow unless we add portables to a site. Um, but often those pieces are limited. So, we think about the barriers to facility, the, a barrier to a program with facilities, meaning do we have actual physical space for a classroom? Um, and just maybe because you have a smaller classroom doesn't necessarily mean that that can house an HC program. It might be good for a smaller program, but for a full class size, that might not be uh, appropriate. Um, there are also some programs that we have like occupational therapy or speech or um, some other programs that require specialized access, um, transitional kindergarten. You wanna ensure that you have bathrooms that are in close proximity to that classroom. Those are factors that we think about when we're thinking about programs locations, is what is the capacity for that specific facility and how does that facility help us to provide access to our students with that? So it's, it's a lot of process when we think about where are we putting programs. We have a lot of different factors to kind of, um, to keep in mind when we're doing those things. So now I'd like to bring your attention, we call this, um, it's a, got a lovely term, it's called the placemat, and it is your, um, it is two slides, it's actually slides 10 and slides 12 stacked, because we want you to be able to see the comparison between our current existence with our uh, highly capable centers, and then kind of some of the proposed changes. And I wanna walk you through each of those changes so that you can understand why we're looking at the changes that we're making and what that looks like. So to start, you can see here, this is our current state, and if we had no changes to any of our feeder elementaries or site or center locations, um, we would have, we currently have seven centers like Director Arnold actually shared. So Cedarwood, Forest View, you can see that all the way to your left side. And those are all of the HC centers. And right next to it, you can see the feeder schools. So all 18 schools are represented in those feeder schools. They have a designated HC center. So students who qualify for the self-contained highly capable program have a designated center that they are transported to when they qualify or identify for that program. Right next to that, you will actually see the total school capacity. Now that school capacity includes the actual physical building as well as any current existing portables on site. So you might be looking at Penny Creek and thinking, I've been in that building, 810 seems like a lot of, that seems like a lot but that's the physical building plus the existing portables that we have. And then next to that, you'll see a 2028 projection. So you're aware that when we do projections for our enrollments, we have a consultant that we work with that tends to be fairly accurate. These are based on the mid-range um, mid numbers from that consultant. And we know that projected four years from now, it will Forest View and Whittier we are anticipated that there will be, we will be over their total school capacity. So that's inclusive of the portables. Um, and so both of those schools are, are going to be challenged because if we continue with the existing number of students, they will be over their total school capacity. That's Forest View and Whittier. Now the challenge that we have with Forest View and Whittier is that both of these sites, while they have existing portables, they have site footprints that do not have space for additional portables to be brought in. 
So if we have schools typically that are over their capacity, we have some conversation with our chief operations officers, we think about those projections and say, wow, we're thinking that we're gonna need another portable to be moved to a site. The challenge with both Whittier and Forest View is those footprints do not have space available for any additional portables. So if we do nothing, what we will wind up with is two schools that will, will, are projected to be over capacity and we will not have a solution for them because we can't bring in a portable to that, those sites. So that just kind of sets the existing stage of what would happen if we made no changes. As you heard earlier, um, in the last five years, we've grown over 250 students within this program. With our universal screening and our, our uh, continued processes with testing, we anticipate that we're gonna continue to grow these programs. So it will be important for us to consider some changes. And actually, if you look at the second slide on the bottom of your placemat, you'll see the proposed changes that we're considering to make. So here on this slide, you can see that we are have the existing seven highly capable centers, plus we are considering adding two additional centers at Monroe Elementary and Silver Firs Elementary. Monroe Elementary School, we would add as a site it's north of 132nd, and so it would actually address some growth opportunities um, in the north end of our district as well. But you'll see that Jefferson, Monroe, and Silver Lake, these are all three schools that fed into Penny Creek's HC Center. We would propose that we create a new center at Monroe, and that the students who qualify at Jefferson, Monroe, and Silver Lake attend that center. This achieves a few things. One, it actually would reduce Penny Creek's population under their projected capacity, and it would bring that student count closer to about 700 students, which you may be thinking, is that more manageable? Or that's a lot of students still, but that building has uh, uh, the capacity to be able to hold those students, and it would actually reduce the amount of students at that building. And in addition, you could actually have uh, all of those students from Jefferson, Monroe, and Silver Lake Monroe is in a centralized area between those schools and actually still allow students to be closer to their neighborhoods and their neighborhood school. So that really achieves uh, one of our goals, which is to ensure that students are still within a part of that community, that they don't have to have an exceptionally long bus ride, and that families have access to be able to participate in school activities fairly easily. The second addition that we would add is Silver Firs Elementary as an HC site. Currently, Silver Firs is a feeder school to the Forest View Center. Um, Forest View, as we talked about on the previous slide, is going to pre is projected to be over their total school capacity in 2028. Um, and Silver Firs actually has enough students qualifying that we could actually put a standalone HC center at Silver Firs and just serve Silver Firs students. So those students would actually be able to attend their neighborhood school, be a part of their neighborhood school community, and they would still be able to receive the services there. So growing a center at that, at that site would actually achieve a lot of our goal. Um, now you can see that uh, that actually does give a problem with projections. So if you look at that 2028 projection, um, it is projecting both Monroe and Silver Firs to be over projection. And as you will remember, Forest View and Whittier were expected to be over their total projection, over their capa building capacity. The only challenge here is, is that even though Silver Firs and Monroe are projected to be over their total school capacity, both of those sites have space that we could add portables that we could actually accommodate that over capacity. So if we wind up, if those projections run true, and in four years, there's a lot of speculation there, but we project that if we do wind up being over school capacity, we could actually add portables to increase that total school capacity and serve those students in a, either their neighborhood school or in a school that is close to their neighborhood. So that would actually alleviate the uh, um, need for additional portable space at Forest View where we don't have room for portables and it would actually bring Penny Creek's population down just um, uh, under closer to 700. The final change that we would propose on this is to actually shift Lowell students who originally fed into the Whittier program and actually have them attend the center at View Ridge Elementary. 
that actually alleviates um, some issues with, uh, with Whittier being over capacity, and it would actually provide additional students to a View Ridge program, which is a relatively small program. But more importantly, those students from Lowell have a shorter bus ride, and it's a school that's closer to their community, and that helps us to meet those goals as well. So that would be the final change there. I will call out the attention. Um, we're still projecting Whittier to be potentially over capacity in 2028. So that's one that we need to watch. We know that's four years from now. We know things may shift. Um, we look forward to getting those annual projections from our consultant to identify what we need to do next or what we might need to consider. Um, but that's one that we want to continue to watch. Uh, we expect that if it continues to grow, we may need to consider a shift from the feeder pattern of um, Garfield, Hawthorne, and Whittier right now to Whittier. We might need to make that a standalone where it's Whittier only, depending on the population. Um, we cannot do that now because if we were to move both Hawthorne and Garfield out of Whittier, that program would be too small to be able to sustain, and you can't have a multiple, multiple grade level classroom like that. So, we want to leave those schools there, but that's one that we're going to continue to watch to ensure that we don't have a school that winds up to be over the capacity. Now that's a lot on your placements. Um, if there, are there any questions or clarifications that I can make about some of these proposed changes for current state? I, have, Director I guess I have three questions. So I think there is expected growth, population growth in the North End. So then that could potentially maybe even open up a third, like you said, but maybe that whole eight schools would be divided up differently kind of thing. And then to make sure it's all even and there's enough capacity but to be determined. If, if there, that's exactly right. If there is growth in the next few years, and this is something that um, our teams are constantly watching of if we have a boom, if we have additional students coming in, one of the opportunities that we have, and um, we, I know we talk a lot about early learning opportunities, but as we have students who are entering kindergarten more ready because of our robust early learning programs, either with our community partners, Play and Learn, Transitional Kindergarten, our ECAP programs, we find that because this is an accelerated program, when students enter kindergarten ready for school, they have a greater opportunity to accelerate their learning and participate in programs like our highly capable program. In addition, the universal screening at first grade allows us to catch students who may not necessarily be referred by a parent. Perhaps there's a language barrier. Perhaps a parent doesn't know very much about a highly capable program. Perhaps a parent says, I, I really just want my student to thrive in their home school. It's, you know, we can walk to it. Those are things that we think may actually influence and increase in our highly capable numbers. Um, all across the district. So we will engage in this process, just watching closely how many students are qualifying, how many students are being placed in their schools, what are some possibilities that we could come up with. So if we do need to grow an additional center, we're going to do that using those, those three factors of facility use, um, uh, uh, location, and then just serving that program. So my next question and then a siblings. So I heard from people like either when Beck was at Penny Creek or people through the years um, with some of the capacity issues kids are getting in the same house different elementary schools is that getting fixed at all or will that be fixed if it hasn't already been fixed we work very hard to ensure that students um, are able to transfer if there's space capacity to be able to have students in one school building that's that's a very important value to us it doesn't help when we have families who are split of, oh, I want you to access this program and, and also my resident area or my neighborhood school is this one and there isn't space capacity. That's really difficult for families and, and, and not even just within Highly Capable. We have other specialized yeah. programs yeah. that have those same pieces. We do, people are allowed to go through that transfer process. They can apply for the transfer process. The biggest barrier, of course, is whether or not there's space availability. So, if there is space available, that is one of those things that is prioritized, which is siblings, um, and wanting to ensure that our families have access to those great programs as well as keeping the family unit together. To I think for them. most of the people I've heard from, if, if Silver Firs is open, then that hopefully opens room up at Cedarwood for those siblings that were getting shuffled between those two, have been shuffled between those two schools for a while. 
The hope would be is that by, by actually opening up two additional centers, we're building capacity in some of those schools so that siblings are going to be able to attend together. Additionally, when we have some, uh, we have some students who um, may be already existing, so like for example, if I'm a Silver Curse student, I've been at the Forest View HC Center for my entire career after first grade. Once I qualified, I went to Forest View. And as a fifth grader, I might say, it's great that I could go back to my neighborhood school and I may choose to do that because I could walk to it or that's where my siblings will want to go. But you may have a student who says, I spent my whole year being a Forest View Falcon and I would like to continue to be a Forest View Falcon. We would allow those students to, to apply for the transfer with that process. As, and if there is space available, we would allow those students to stay because we do think that that's an important value if that of a student um, has become a part of that school community, whether it's their neighborhood school or not. We want to try and honor that as much as we possibly especially if it might be the only one that moves. Right. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Oh, yes. Yes, Director Wodlinski. Um, can you can you go back to the previous slide? Sure. Um, so here, it looks like Penny Creek doesn't have a problem, right? So Penny Creek doesn't have over. There's no comments, and then we go to the next page, and we're making changes in Penny Creek. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, are we solving a problem that doesn't exist? Um, so in this case situation with Penny Creek, it is not over capacity currently, and it is not projected to be over capacity in 2028. However, that building is getting very large and it, it is projected to be very close to that 810 capacity. So it is one of those things that while it's not yet over and not projected to be over, we know that it's getting very close to that. And it would provide us with an opportunity to have Jefferson Silver Lake students being served in a neighborhood school that isn't uh, that isn't as large as Penny Creek. So you're right, there isn't an overcapacity issue right now, but there is a potential for that long term. Is that why Penny Creek starts so late? Penny <laughs> Creek starts at 9:15 a.m., and I believe that all late start elementary schools start at 9:15 a.m. That's more busing. It's busing. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, we were just talking about busing, right? Because mm -hmm. we have to bus kids there that would normally go to, say, a different school, right? Yes. Uh, when, when are you thinking these changes would go into effect? Well, what we would propose is that we would actually engage within our communication plan, and these would be in place for the 25 26 school year. So it would start next fall. So you'd be upscaling a bunch of teachers, too. Potentially. Potentially. Okay. Potentially. okay. Is, is there special training for highly capable or is there just special CE that they might get to advance what they know? For our highly capable teachers, they, they participate in the professional learning at the building level, of course, but we also provide additional professional learning to talk about how you can do additional differentiation with students who are um, both highly capable and gifted and talented. There are um, allocations that we provide for those teachers to participate in the state um, gifted and talented, a highly capable professional learning. There's a consortium that happens on an annual basis. And we do additional support um, around how to utilize curriculum, how to kind of go deeper rather than just abroad. Um, so there are opportunities there. However, this is a program that those teachers don't necessarily, like a special education teacher, if you were to reduce a special education program at a building, that teacher would be moved and placed where that program goes. Highly capable teachers are building teachers first. Mm -hmm. And so in the event of um, shifting teachers from perhaps maybe Forest View, if you reduce those, those teaching staff and they may not necessarily need to move to Silver Firs, they may switch to another grade level. There may be attrition at that building where that teacher says, oh, well, if I'm not going to be teaching highly capable at Forest View, I'd like to stay at Forest View. And if I could teach another grade level, I would do that. So not a training is not a prerequisite, it sort of comes with their continuing education. Correct. And, and we also provide on an annual basis for, for staff who are new to highly capable, we continue to do some of that additional work. Dr. Salz. Just yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I, I had more. Yes, of course. Um, so the growth over the last five years is like 36%, right? That's 36% growth. Is that, I mean, is there just something in the water? You know, like what's, because Overall, enrollment is not uh, growing like that, right? 8% a year, or is it? Um... District-wide, 
our growth, I would I would defer to some of my colleagues who are who are watching those numbers a little bit more closely than I. However, what we do know is that where we do experience growth is typically in the south end of the district where there are more families moving in and those pieces. But I would actually say that one of the biggest factors and contributors to our growing highly capable population are two things. One, increased participation in robust early learning programs, whether they are district sponsored or whether they are community partners. And two, our universal screening processes in first grade are helping to identify and have conversations with families who may not necessarily refer a student for highly capable education, who then may actually say, wow, my student has a specific aptitude. Maybe I will consider to do those things. So we do think that that is a factor in um, in the increase of the number of students in highly capable programming. Can I, can I also make a comment that in 2019 we had 630 students, which is like if we had 20,000, that's like just over 3%, you know, 3.3% or something. Whereas in 2024, we're now up to about 4.5%. And, you know, if you look at the universal population and you're saying that 5 to 10% identify as highly capable, we are now finally getting close to. Um, what the population should be <laughs> and to qualify those students that we listed there are not are not necessarily all the students who are identified those are students who are currently in centers we often have families who will go through the process of hc testing and then decide my student actually wants to stay in their neighborhood school and their neighborhood school community they don't want to go to another so we serve them through a lead program or we serve them through additional services so when we look at that, um, that 847, it's actually just the students who are served in the self-contained classroom. Right. So there are actually Could more, be more students out there who are not in those programs because they like they prefer to stay at their home neighborhood school. Question about that. So that math you're doing over the entire population, I don't think you can do it like that, right? This is five to ten percent of people in elementary school because people. They, they leave highly capable and they're those highly capable kids are in high school right like you can't you can't do the division on the whole it, can you do the division on the whole enrollment or is it at in elementary i i would say that it is in a so it's um i hear what you're saying which is we have students who are qualified in highly capable program across the district um they we do not do qualification once they are out of once they are out of fourth grade. Right, um, so there are students that may have a highly capable designation because they were within program in the elementary school. But also then we have students who are able to differentiate and advance and accelerate their learning, may not qualify or have a designation of HC, but are students that have the capacity to accelerate their learning because of the education that they've received here. They're able to take compacted six, seven math, or they're able to take advanced science in eighth grade, and then when they get in. So, it is a challenge to say, you know, 800, 847 students out of 20,000, but those are for the elementary pieces. You could say 847 out of all of the elementary level students, and that might be more accurate um, description of that, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but I think for what we're looking at is we're looking at just the growth that we've had because of the programming that we've been, in, we've been instituting and supporting those students as best we can. So it's growing, we know that. Um, I'm not the mathematician that I would love to be, but um, I would say that what we continue to do is watch those numbers and as they're growing, start thinking about the short-term implications, meaning how do we ensure that our students next year are going to have the space to grow and learn the way we would like them to in a, a school that's close to their neighborhood? And then the long-term projections, which is, and how do we ensure that four years from now, we don't six months before school starts say, oh my gosh, we need two more portables at Whittier. We're not gonna be able to serve these students and there's no place to put them. So our, our responsibility is just trying to take the, the long game on that and look at what we can do to support, um, support really thoughtful placements of those different pieces. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess where I'm ultimately coming from with this is um, we're talking about significant action, right? This is gonna affect people and especially if it's next year, right? This is this is a big change for people. And um, I still don't know that I fully understand the problem statement, you know? Like, wh why is it, why has it grown 36%? And what is our percentage of people in high cap in elementary school? And is that in the five to 10% range? And then I would also ask, um, 
no one can 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 a kid enter high cap in third grade or yes. do they, they have to start and does that happen frequently is that a frequent occurrence yes. yeah. we have students. i can testify it happens <laughs> we have so From personal there's experience a, there's a couple of things that we can address one so the issue with penny creek is not necessarily it will bring penny creek's population down a little bit but one of the other things that we can do is that we can actually serve students um, Jefferson, Monroe, and Silver Lake, we have enough students within those three schools to be able to substantiate a full program. And it's close to their resident area. For those Monroe students, that actually might increase the number of students who are identified and participating in that program because it's in their resident area school. The Jefferson and Silver Lake students, that school is close to their neighborhood school, and we can substantiate a full, a full program at that building. We can continue to substantiate, because of the number of students at Penny Creek, we can substantiate a full program at Penny Creek. And that accomplishes providing a service for students in their resident home neighborhood school. So those Penny Creek students who live in the Penny Creek neighborhood can attend Penny Creek, they can get access to the program that they need, and it's not impacting anything else. Our students in Monroe can access the program they need in their home school, and if we shift the Jefferson and Silver Lake students who are already attending another school, but if we have those Jefferson and Silver Lake students attend Monroe, it's close to their neighborhood school, we can substantiate a full center with that population there. So the problem that it solves for shifting students from Penny Creek is that where we have one center now in one school and three schools have to travel to that, we can actually substantiate a center at Penny Creek for Penny Creek students in their neighborhood school and a program at Monroe to serve Monroe students in their neighborhood school and still serve Jefferson and Silver Lake. So yeah, yeah, for context, the, the reason I'm uh, so interested in this is because this has my kid moving from Penny Creek to Monroe next mm -hmm. year. You know, so I really identify with people that are going to be impacted by this. Yes. So. And, and I think one of the things that we think really intentionally about is how will this impact families? How can we provide services to families in a really meaningful way and minimize the impact? And when we have growth like this, we want to make sure that we're doing this really thoughtfully, really intentionally. We've been working with the superintendent's cabinet um, in really, really interrogating this problem for several weeks now, really in preparation for this. Because when we do moves, when even though we're, growth is an exciting thing and increasing our program is an exciting thing, this is about families. And anytime we ever look at numbers or we ever look at statistics, we know that those are our students. And so we very intentionally think, what can we do to best serve our populations and minimize the impact to families? So there are opportunities for, for students, like I said, who are currently in program. We can, uh, if there's space available, we wanna be able to provide them with transfers so that they're able to meet those needs. But we also wanna try and make sure that we're being really responsible in looking at the long term of how can we best serve our students and our families in their their resident area, their neighborhood school as close to it as possible to their home. Thank you. Well, and so that and so just because I was reading a book, um, you know, the diversity of the South End is really changed and just reading a book about how with that diversity sort of raises all tides and so it's it's you know it'd be interesting to see what what the diversity of kids in the south end look like um, in those programs just because it has changed so much that you know is that an explanation for why it has gone up 36 percent because it's it's raising all tides so you know all kids in the south end are experiencing maybe something different because of that diversity. Not that it's not happening all that, but it's, it's, you know, just because it raises all kinds. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, first, I just thank you for answering that question of following Director Mason, why the numbers have gone up, okay? Um, Kevin has brought this to my attention the past few weeks. That's why we're doing a workshop tonight for information and questions to the board. Uh, it, it's very important that we have this workshop. Clear context tonight is that we want your input. We want you to go through the process with us. 
Going back to your question regarding the teachers and movements, I could assure you with your input and that we're going to be side by side with our teachers and our parents as we once you ask the questions and give us good direction tonight. Uh, this is not an isolation. If and when we move forward, we're going to be side by side with our parent community. We're going to be side by side with our teacher community, our paraprofessional community, because yes, this has changed, but in a large system, we want to bring this to you tonight. So there's no surprises. This is why you workshop. This is why you give information. So I just wanted to answer your question about, you know, the teachers and the change and then the numbers, why they've gone up. It's pretty normal now at this point from 2019 to where we are now. Uh, and uh, we're right on par. I, I will say as a as superintendent that part of it is the early childhood lens that you've put on the system of identification. So I think as we get context and candor here this evening, it's just important for me to make that statement. So thank you. And one last question. Do you guys have numbers of who, who's tested in and elected out because they didn't want to move? That, that Monroe and Silver Firs might have capacity for maybe those few that will now say, oh, it's here. So we're going to we're going to opt in now. Yes, we do, capacity. we do have those numbers. I don't have them for you this evening, but we do have those numbers. And in fact, it's one of the factors that when we thought about what we needed to do, we know that we have, um, at, like, for example, at Silver Firs, there are several students at Silver Firs who say, I've qualified, but I don't want to go. Even though that is really close, Silver Firs and Forest View are very close to each other, they love their school. They love their school community. I know that Garfield has uh, at least five students who have identified for this program, and they're supposed to go to Whittier. They don't want to go, and it's because they love their community school. They can walk to their school. Their friends are there. Um, it is truly, you know, uh, I think a testimony to the work that our staff and our building leaders have done in cultivating really positive school environments where kids love showing up every day. That makes a difference. That makes a difference. And so we would love to have an HC center at every one of our 18 schools. It's not fiscally responsible for us to be able to do that. We can't serve it. The population is still yet too small to be able to serve students that way. But we can think creatively about how we can try and best serve them as close to their neighborhood schools so that they can still be part of that community, which is really important. Community schools are important. Okay. Yeah, I just um, wanted to say, I think this is just a really, really strong plan, uh, given your requirements and, and the goals that you were trying to meet. I mean, we're going from um, nine to 11 uh, programs that are within their home schools now. So seven to nine. Seven to nine? Yes. Oh, did I miscount? That's okay. Oh, I was, you know what I was doing? I was counting the other option, the opposite way of the ones that don't have to go. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Wrong numbers. That's okay. <laughs> a little backwards. But um, I just think that's a big win when we can start offering the program within a home school. And, um, you know, with the changes, I mean, change is not easy. And we go through this uh, with boundary adjustments and such. Um, but, you know, the um, process of grandfathering in for those who really feel very strongly, like, for example, Penny Creek's losing a lot of students if they're going <laughs> elsewhere. So there should be potentially capacity if, you know, parents feel very strongly about that. So um, I think you've done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. That, that being said, I also think you did a great job. <laughs> I'm just passionate. Yeah. Thank you. Really? We, passion is important, and I think anytime when we're talking about how we can best serve our students, uh, you know, we have to utilize that passion and understanding. I mean, many of, many of the cabinet members, Dr. Salzman is a parent, and we understand that when, we, when we're making changes like this, we not only have to support the needs of our systems, but we have to support the needs of our families, for our students, and we want to do that in the most thoughtful and intentional way possible. So this is actually a really good segue to our next steps, which is that communication plan. So in, uh, in tandem with our communications officer and that department, we want to make sure that we are in, ensuring that we are communicating clearly with staff so that they know what's going to happen, as well as um, doing some current outreach for families, for HC families. So, that is not, we don't want our families to feel like, oh, we're just doing something to you because it's an arbitrary move. We want to actually communicate really transparently and clearly, this is what's going to happen. This is when it's going to happen. It may actually influence um, HC testing referrals are just coming up in the next week or two. 
so that families can refer. I think they're actually due by this Friday. Um, so that families can actually say, as we're moving forward in testing, this is where my student will go to school. And that helps them give a long enough runway to be able to make a family-based decision. Like, if I want to go ahead and move forward with this, what will that look like? Um, what will that look like maybe for daycare or childcare or my sibling, children's siblings, et cetera? Sorry, sorry, President Mitchell. You said, you said will. So you're getting feedback on this plan. How will this impact? Not, I mean, not that we would. Have, I don't think we have to vote on this, but Correct. but before we go out, you know, your child's been, and we're going to open one in Monroe. A decision will be made before that time to confirm they'll be in Monroe. We'll be notified, and then parents will be notified. What we'd like to do yes. is we'd actually like to explain, just like we did here tonight. We're okay. sharing with you first of what this might what this would look like this is our proposal okay. and what we're looking for from you is some input and considerations that we may not have considered we've really grappled with this process um, but there's always other perspectives and what we'd like to do is share with parents this is our proposed plan what concerns do you have what what do you not understand we have um we have actually developed a frequently asked questions we'll post that on the district website we'll actually do a parent school square communication out to HC families, inviting them to have some discourse with us so that we can say, what are you thinking about? What are your concerns? Um, what are some things that maybe we did not anticipate so that we can have a very well-rounded plan moving forward to help meet the needs of our students? Um, and so those pieces, those pieces are really helpful because we don't want to just say, we think we thought of everything. Here's what we're gonna do. We really wanna say, here's the proposal that we have what are some things we haven't thought about? What are some concerns? Um, it may not necessarily always mitigate the issue, but it may help give us better insights about how we can help to make this a, a smoother and facilitate the transition for families, um, or think about other opportunities that may be an impact for them. So I think uh, in addition, um, we really want to ensure that as the proposals, um, as these are proposed, that would take effect in the 25-26 school year, um, and as I shared, uh, the students who have, um, who have uh, a vested interest in staying at their, at their school, particularly those fifth graders who may have spent their entire career there, um, thinking about the opportunities to be able to provide a transfer um, space available wise, um, but, and then soliciting that feedback from families so that we can ensure that um, we have a really good process moving forward with, this, with our decision. So finally, the next steps that we're thinking about is, again, the big factor as we continue to grow our program, and we know that we're going to continue to grow this program, um, is increasing the diversity of our HC programs. We know that the diversity um, is not where we'd like it to be. We know that we have an underrepresentation of students who are Latino, students who are Black and African, um, students who are, low, uh, who are experiencing poverty. All of those students are currently underrepresented in a lot of our data. And so as we continue to look at how do we grow these programs and capture more students who need that acceleration, what does that look like? Well, that, that uh, universal screening in grade one can really help us to serve this program. The universal screening in grade five, like um, Director Arnold had talked about, that gives us the opportunity that if we get them late in the elementary game, if they're not able to um, participate in that program, we can at least identify and make some recommendations for advanced options as they progress into their secondary realm. So, wow, you, you have demonstrated on this universal screen here that you have a great aptitude in math. You should consider taking math 6-7 as a sixth grader rather than just sixth grade math. Um, and it provides us opportunities to be able to give our students um, optimal opportunities to advance and accelerate through their secondary experience. And then increasing that access to that high quality early learning programs. We can't emphasize enough. We know there's a direct correlation when students come into kindergarten ready with those domains in our, for our WAPKIDS data. We know that 85% of those students continue to pass the SBA in literacy in third grade. And we know that the third grade SBA is an indicator for on-time graduation. So we know that more students are coming in ready for kindergarten, ready to learn. And as we continue to develop those programs, we think it's going to open up the opportunity for those students to accelerate, regardless of race, program, um, or any income qualification. And then finally, as we continue to do this, and we think, wow, five years ago, we had just opened Tambar Creek. There was a full HC center there. 
In the future, we're not sure what things will hold, but we need to continue to look at what our programs are offering, where our programs are located. If there is a future bond or levy that might open another elementary school, that might be a factor where we might need to think about how we're programming, how we're establishing programs based on location and facilities. Are we building facilities that are going to meet the needs of our families? And ensuring that if we have the opportunity to educate students in their neighborhood school is a priority. We really want to do that for our families, for our students, because we think that's a critical component. So that brings us to some feedback. I know you've asked lots of questions, but we would love some input um, from you. So if based on what you've learned this evening, what input do you have for us? And are there considerations that we should be thinking about that we maybe have not yet thought about? Or some things that you think might be a prioritized consideration um, to communicate to our families or as we're moving through this process. So I I have other questions about the highly capable program, but no, nothing that relates to this, and I, I can save my questions for offline. I'll just chime in. What a celebration to include two more schools being able to host a program at their, their neighborhood school. Uh, I think both my questions were answered because that was an interesting, that was what I came in with tonight, is wondering how many students are, are losing, losing out because they're making that hard choice, that difficult choice. Um, we're always trying to find the best match of academic rigor for where the students at, the students where they're at. Another wondering I had is with, with this, both what was answered tonight about students that maybe were given the option that choose not to because they want to stay at their, their home school. Um, are there students, are there families that are entering into or questions about HC, do I want to do this? Do I want to make the move? Um, I'm guessing we have parent information night or because are there families that then they've tried it for six months it's not working one year they, they move back and what what does that look like are we are we giving them enough information to make a good choice we um i, I think that is uh one of the things that we think a lot about is that um there are lots of families who may know about highly capable programming but not have all of the information or may go into it with a supposition of oh this is just for gifted and talented or this is just for a certain kind of student and then we have some families who have never heard of a, an accelerated program like Highly Capable. Um, so we do a, a very concerted effort in educating. Um, we do parent presentations, um, especially for our school centers that have those Highly Capable uh, programs, um, but really trying to communicate out to families, this is what this program is. Um, I believe we've used Parent Square pretty effectively in sending out information. Um, but one of the things that we really, we really emphasize is we utilize our teachers to be able to communicate with our families because they're the closest to the students. So both Ann and I work at the central office, um, we can have that conversation, but truly and honestly, where parents are most likely to hear that this is an opportunity for students are those teachers, those practitioners in the classroom who know those students, who can say, hey, I really noticed your child has an aptitude for this. I think they should continue to do this or a teacher who says, wow, this student went through universal screening in first grade and look at these scores. I may not necessarily see this performance in the classroom, but this is a conversation I can have with a parent. And so I think that's one of the, the greatest assets that we have is we have a really solid teaching core, uh, teaching core who really reaches out to parents and communicates with parents and um, develops those partnerships where we can have a conversation. I can go up to a parent and say, wow, your student got this score good job, we should consider this program. But it has a lot more meaning when it comes from somebody who is close to that student, um, that's somebody who knows that student very well and can have that conversation with a parent saying, I think this is an opportunity to accelerate your child's learning and I think you should consider it. Thanks. I just want to say I also really appreciate the emphasis I've heard tonight on um, the communication with parents, communication with, with teachers, uh, because next year is coming fast and we start making plans. and so if there are any opportunities for grandfathering in, allowing students to remain making that choice. Although numbers are tricky, balancing class size can be tricky, but as much as possible offering that as a choice, because as soon as they're given that letter, they do, it's, a, it's almost like a school choice yes. issue, but by invitation. Yeah. Thanks. I guess I should have a follow-up to that, because 
is, um, you know, when we do boundary changes, whole neighborhoods move. So yeah, your friend might not live in, your best friend might not live in your neighborhood, but your, you know, your neighbors are moving. With this, because it's pulling three kids here, two kids there, two kids here, um, that transfer usually means parent drives versus busing. And so to, to Roman's point, um, if parents can't drive, but the kid is a fifth grader or a, or a fourth, even a fourth grader, or the parent just loves it, then it gets tricky because then it is sort of, no, we've, we've limited you. And your kid now is the only kid that now has to go to a different school versus all of his peers. So it is, I think, just being cognizant of that, that it, it's not the whole neighborhood, it is one and two kids potentially. And I think um, when, when we think about our neighborhood schools, while it's a community around a school, it could be a, a fairly large catchment area, right? Yeah. So it could be, it could be, you know, a couple miles apart. Um, I think one of the things that we need to commit to is taking a look at, well, if there are families and staff who or excuse me, students and families who are interested in a grandfathering, is that is that an option? Is transportation an option? And I think that that's a difficult one to explore until we actually have some numbers about what that might look like. Um, we may we can't make that commitment, but I think it's something that we're continuing to look at and consider of what could we do? Because our ultimate goal is to have the least disruption on students' environment, um, their learning environment, and to still provide fiscally responsible services to meet the needs of all students. So it is a really challenging balancing act. And, um, there are many, many times, I'm sure my colleagues would agree, that we wish children came in nice little neat 24 packs that just were in these, <laughs> you know, in a, in a way that was easy to distribute and we could have a very lovely balanced staffing model, but it doesn't work that way. And so there's lots of different complexities when we're thinking about where we need to have our programs and how do we serve our students. Um, but ultimately what we want is we also, we have to have that head for leadership, but we also have to have the heart, which is, how are we helping to serve our students in a way that really minimizes the impact and change for them? And how do they not hear, well, you just have a transfer when they know that means no transportation. How do we soften that to say, right, we don't have the ability to have a transportation even though we know this is important and how do we accommodate you? And, and, that, and that's what you guys are experts. I, thank you for your confidence in us. <laughs> are there any other questions I'd like to? I, I had a quick one. one. Good, a quick easy one. Um, I think it's a quick easy one. Does LEAP come with the same kind of funding per student as highly capable? I'm, I don't believe that it has any additional funding because it's not a highly qualifying, it wouldn't qualify for grant support. And could you, here, do you want to? So LEAP is a grant though. Capable. Everything that we do for highly capable students, whether it's a self-contained classroom or the LEAP classrooms, are, fall under highly capable. The difference, I think, is that the services that we provide LEAP don't have the price tag, the services that we provide self-contained classrooms right. do. Yeah. So we offer um, additional resources, we have facilitators who go in to do that, but it's more um, how we distribute the funds in order to meet the needs of the programs. So for example, the self-contained classroom, we have accelerated math and reading, but we also have um, additional resources like junior grade books or like CIA books. Those, there are things there that we supply that we don't supply necessarily unless they're asked for in the LEAP classroom. So the grant could be used everywhere. Uh, we can provide professional learning for teachers to come and, and they're more than welcome and they often do come to things, but they don't, um, doesn't have the designation because it doesn't have the service attached to it. Thank you. I also, I just wanted to um, comment because it's been my observation that um, that uh, kids, you know, the, the um, decision to participate in Highly Capable is so individual where some kids are so miserable in a gen ed classroom, they really need that stimulus and then some kids love being in a gen ed classroom and being a classroom leader, you know, and, and uh, being able to hone some of those skills uh, within amongst their peers. So it's not always just location or testing in or out kind of thing. So, um, yeah. yeah. The personal experience is, is definitely a factor for some families and students as well. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, 
there's a lot of grades ahead of also that, you know, there's opportunities like you pointed out in middle school and high school for kids that choose otherwise to continue their learning in different ways. Absolutely. We're very proud of our advanced options for students across the board. So um, we hope to catch them one way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like to turn to the Oh, Roman. Can I oh, Roman? Um, Dr. You've, you've mentioned uh, fiscally responsible a couple times. And uh, so I'm curious if you have a, a sense of um, either, it, I mean, we're, we're expanding, I mean, this feels like an expansion of the program, mm -hmm. which, you know, uh, sounds more expensive, which is fine, you know, but um, it, do you have a sense for what, what is the financial impact on uh, program expansion? Is, is it, is it, does it cost less to do it this way because of uh, busing? The, the more students that qualify impacts the amount of our highly capable grant that we're allocated each year from the state. Um, so generally speaking, the more students you have, the increase in dollars you would have be allocated from the state to serve those students. Um, I think it depends. There are some students that we're busing from schools that, so for example, Lowell students currently go to Whittier. That is a long bus ride. That may not necessarily be the most cost effective, but that's where we have it right now. Um, you may not necessarily see substantial decreases or increases with a Silver Firs moving back to Silver Firs from Forest View because of the proximity of those two schools. Those schools are less than a mile apart. Um, it may not necessarily impact those pieces. So uh, generally speaking, it, when I speak about the fiscal responsibility, we would love to have 18 highly capable centers in each of the 18 elementary schools. But the staffing costs and um, a, the capacity to be able to run 18 centers when you have multiple, if four grade levels, um, and you may not necessarily generate all of those self-contained students in that one school. So for example, Hawthorne, if they have 12 kids that qualify across four grade levels, you're not going to be able to substantiate four staff members to teach those students at Hawthorne. They would need to go to a centralized location. So that's when I'm speaking about that fiscal responsibility. Um, while we'd like to have centers at every building, it won't, it's not sustainable that way because of the way our staffing is allocated. So your question about transportation and things like that, we won't have all of those details until we know what students are, um, are qualifying, but we anticipate that it will not be, um, it, will not, it will be commensurate with what we're currently doing. But when I'm talking about being fiscally responsible, I'm talking about centralizing program as opposed to having a program, a standalone program in every building. Got it. I, I guess I was just kind of asking, um, it feels like um, the, you know, if we boil this down to the salient points, we want to expand the program. Here's how much it costs. And I think it's difficult for me to answer that because students have yet not qualified. Totally. Yeah. They have yet not qualified, so expansion of the program, meaning that we may not have to bus Monroe students, the Silver Lake students and the Jefferson students who are being bused to Penny Creek if they're going to Monroe. If they're closer to Monroe, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, more cost effective. Penny Creek students will attend Penny Creek. So there should be some pieces where it might be more cost savings, um, but until we actually know how many students are identified in the next year, we won't have a, a concise number for that. And so there's more time to have these conversations, and we've gone over a little bit. So I think for the honor of time, yeah. if I can close. I'd, I'd like to provide Dr. Salzman, thank you thank for you. this opportunity. Thank you. You bet. First of all, we will not break the bank over this. I'm going to stress that to everybody. Second of all, what an opportunity for our community. What an opportunity for our community. We will work side by side with every group with empathy. And anytime kids move, it's going to affect a parent or two or maybe more. And we will lead with empathy as we go through this. But uh, tonight was information and to get your input and to 
see what you would like from us and to know uh, where, we're, where we're headed. This took weeks of uh, collaboration by the team. And uh, Ann Arnold, thank you for your expertise that you brought to us. Uh, but this didn't just happen yesterday. Uh, we want to be real thoughtful. We want to bring it to you first because eventually we're going to have to communicate to a lot of groups, all right? And uh, so uh, that's what I wanted to share with you this evening. That's why we presented this to you. But uh, this is an opportunity, uh, a great opportunity for our entire system. And I just want to reiterate that to everybody. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. And other than that, adjourns the special meeting of October 29th. Thank you. <laughs>